Well, good morning. Thank you to the hand chimes for leading us as we prepare our hearts for worship, as we think about entering into this week into Thanksgiving and being able to gather and celebrate with our families. Uh, We are also wrapping up, so the church year ends this Sunday. The Sunday before Thanksgiving is always the last Sunday of the church year, and it's Christ the King Sunday, which recognizes, and I think it's appropriate for us, uh, that always on the heels of an election season, whether the person we voted for or not has been elected, to realize that Christ is the one who is king. He is the one who reigns over everything. So we've been doing a series called God's Guarantees. We are wrapping that up today, realizing that God is the one that brings us together. So thanks for gathering this morning. Special welcome to the baptism family as little John is baptized this morning as a part of our worship service. So let's stand, let's welcome each other to worship, and then you can stay standing as we sing our opening hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
It's one of those songs where you sing enough verses and you think, my throat's getting a little bit tight here. I might be losing my voice slightly. And yet, that's okay. That's exactly the point. Because in the end, we join everyone gathered around the throne and we sing his praises as we crown him Lord of all. So let's gather in his name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We have the opportunity this morning, once again as a congregation, regularly to bring another little child to be baptized and welcomed into God's family. And as we prepare for that, just to pause and to ask ourselves, why do we do this? What is the importance of baptism? And Jesus gathers his disciples together before he ascends into heaven, and he says, Go and make disciples of all nations. And a disciple is someone who knows, loves, trusts in, and seeks to follow the ways of Jesus. So go and make disciples of all nations. And the first part of that is to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And yet different churches handle baptism differently. So some churches, like a Lutheran church or a Catholic church, choose to bring even the little children to be baptized as we do this morning. And other churches wait until that child is older. So why do we practice baptism the way that we do? And and the, the simple reason is because God invites us to do that. And because even the littlest of children are sinners who are in need of God's mercy and God's forgiveness. So the Bible is clear that we are sinful from the time that we are conceived, that just as there is a physical DNA that we pass on to our children, and Jack and Kylie, I'm sure that you can look at little John and say, oh yeah, he's got his mom's look here, his dad's looks there. There's also ways in which we pass on our temperaments and our shortcomings to our children. And as he continues to grow, you can probably see some of that. And you'll get to this point, if you haven't already, where you say, guess what your child did? And you're pointing the finger because you know that somehow they are who they are because of who you are as a parent. And the Bible says that's how sin works. It is passed on down through the family line. And yet, God desires to have mercy and grace on us and to offer forgiveness to us. And so Jesus, when he is spending time with people, he spends time with the littlest of them. And some people might say, you know, you need to spend time with those who can actually hear and understand what you're saying. And yet Jesus pauses and says, no, wait a minute. Don't stop the little children from coming to me because the kingdom of God belongs to them. In fact, unless you can believe like one of these little ones, you can't enter into the kingdom. Sometimes we complicate things too much as adults. When to understand faith, yes, faith is always seeking understanding, but faith is simply trust. And it's a willingness to live your life underneath somebody else's care. Just like little John trusts you as mom and dad. You know, I said this morning when you bring him to be baptized, I'm going to let you hold on to him because he's at that age and stage where he's got a little bit of stranger danger. He might not trust me. He doesn't know me, but he knows you as parents. And Jesus says, even the littlest of ones are in the Father's care and can be received into his family. So just as little John was born into your family, so the Bible talks about how baptism is being born again through water and God's word being welcomed into God's family as we say, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. To know that he has a father along with his earthly dad who loves him unconditionally. He has a heavenly father who loves him unconditionally. To know that, that when he's not the perfect kid, and he won't be, the perfect child. To know that he has Jesus who stands in as the perfect kid for him. And to know that as he's making decisions in life that he would be guided by the Holy Spirit, that holy conscience that God puts into us to guide us according to the truth of God's holy word. That's God's family. That's a family that he is entering into today. That's why we're here. That's why we celebrate baptism today. So I'm going to invite you as parents and godparents to come forward, and as the family comes forward, we know that John is blessed to be a part of a wonderful family, much of you as family that's able to join us today, and he's part of that family because of his mom and his dad and the family names that they have, but today he gets to enter into a larger family. As 
the name of God is put on him, he now becomes a part of the entire family of God. Which means that all of you who have had that same name placed on you in your baptism, you are now part of John's extended family. So I'm going to ask you if you will walk beside this family and support them as they raise little John to know the love of Jesus, to know that he is welcomed here at St. John's, and to support and to pray for this family. If you're willing to do that, say yes with the help of God. And then for you as parents and godparents, you have that ever-important responsibility as well, not only to bring him here to be baptized today, but Jesus says that part of raising our children to know his love and his ways means that we're teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded us, which is a big undertaking. I know that you guys prayed for this moment. I know that you prepared for this moment to have a family, and now you have hopes and dreams and desires for him. And ultimately, God has plans for him as well. And part of that plan is to be raised in the Christian faith. So I'm going to ask you a few simple questions as a sign of your commitment to continue to raise him to know the will and the ways of Jesus. So first of all, as he is entering into God's family, we have to recognize that there is an enemy, that Satan would desire nothing else than to cause him to stumble and to stray. So do you renounce the devil? in all his works, and all his ways? If so, say yes. And then do you intend to teach John the Christian faith, especially as we know it, according to the Apostles' Creed, according to the Ten Commandments, and according to the Lord's Prayer? If so, say yes with God's help. And then will you make sure that he is brought to church and taught how to worship, even amidst the wiggles and the whines, which are a part of being a little boy? Will you pray for him, and as he grows, teach him how to pray? Will you be that godly example to him in faith and life? And will he, you, as he continues to grow, place God's words into his hands and into his heart so that he can know the ways of Jesus for himself? If so, say yes with God's help. Then as a sign of your commitment to that, I'm going to ask you just to take your finger and dip it in the water this morning and make the sign of a cross on his forehead. We knew he was going to wiggle a little bit. All right, then let's lean him down. And John Henry Kafusman, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for him this morning. Father, we thank you that in very simple ways you welcome children into your family. We thank you for the love that you have poured out on John today. And Lord, I pray that he continues to remain strong in that love, that his parents, his godparents, his family, this congregation would show him that love and support and would lead him to know your love, which is present for him every day that he lives. Guide him according to your will and your words. In your name we pray. Amen. And then one thing that I'd like to share with you as a family. So candles are used in our worship as a sign of God's presence with us. And also, uh, we use candles regularly when we celebrate birthdays. So, John has a birthday, but today he has the opportunity to celebrate another birthday, a baptism birthday. So when you celebrate his birthday, you'll have cake, you'll have candles, and you'll sing for him. And our encouragement to you is that on November 20th, each year, you'll also, in preparation for Thanksgiving, pull out this candle, light it, and remind him that he's not only a part of your family, he's a part of God's family, and you're grateful for that. And if you want to sing happy baptismal birthday to him, you can do that as well. Oh, look, he is clued in on the candle this morning. I'm not going to let him touch it. <laughs> See, we've got water and now we've got fire, so. 
But, Jack, I'm going to share this with you and invite you to take that with you this morning as we welcome the newest member of God's family here at St. John's, John Henry Kapusman. I'll let you blow that out, and we can return to our seats as we sing our next hymn, a baptismal hymn, Father Welcomes. I invite you then to stand as you're able out of respect this morning for the reading of our Holy Gospel words from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to his disciples and to us in John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated then, and all of the kids who are gathered with us this morning can come forward for a special children's message from Katie. Okay, put your hands down. Easy question, right? Now, do you think your parents would still love you if you like cartoons? Yeah? What if you don't like cartoons? Do you think they'd still love you? Yeah. Yeah. What about if you like football? Do you think your parents would still love you? Yeah. What about if you don't like football, but they still love you? Yeah. But I hate football. Well, I'm sorry. They still love you. What if you like the color pink? Do you think your parents still love you? Yeah. What if you don't like the color pink? Yeah. Yeah, they would still love you, right? What if you don't listen and you don't do your chores? Do you think they still love you? Yep. Absolutely. They would still love you because they are your parents. And no matter what you do, they might not be happy with you in every moment of every day, but they will still love you no matter what. Now think about, if your parents love you that much, think about God. All throughout Scripture, and Pastor Josh just did, talked about this when he was talking about John's baptism, and even our banner says, this is my child, right? I have called you by name. All throughout Scripture, we are called children of God. And if our earthly parents love us that much, imagine how much God, our Heavenly Father, loves us. He loves us so much that there is absolutely nothing, nothing that can separate us from that love. No matter what we do, no matter what we say, God always loves us. And he loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die and to take away all of our sins for us. And that'll never, ever change. So can you guys please pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the love you give and the life you gave. Help us to show that love in all we do. Amen. You guys can go back and take your seats. We'll continue with our sermon hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West. Uh, If you want to pull out a hymnal and follow along, it's one that we have sung before, but not as frequently here at St. John's.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, as we reflect on the last in our sermon series of God's guarantees, God, help us continue to hear your guarantees, to hear your promises, God, as we remember today how you bring us together, how you unite us as a people, God, all through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us continue, God, to look for your guarantees and all your promises that you continue to give us as we go towards Advent and Christmas. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the United States of America. It's something you've probably heard so many times that you don't even give it a second thought. It's simply just the country that we live in. But the word I believe that is the most important out of all those is unite. See, the word speaks of the unity that exists. It shows that we are much more than just the state of Minnesota. Instead, we are a collective group, something bigger than ourselves. Yes, in Minnesota, we have our own laws, but in no way are we our own country. Now, I'd argue that there is nothing more than a symbol of this United States of America than the flag itself, the flag of our country. Now, the flag contains, of course, 50 stars that represent each and every one of our states that make up the Union. The horizontal lines, of course, represent our past, the original 13 colonies that declared their independence from Great Britain. The flag has stood <laughs> as a symbol of unity over the entire history of our country and has also been a part of some of the most famous pieces of artwork and media and photography. And this morning, I want to share some of those images with you. First, we see this famous painting of George Washington and the Patriots crossing the Delaware River. Next, we see the raising of the flag at Iwo Jima. This was in the throes of World War II. This image would win a Pulitzer Prize and be replicated all over the country to show the resolve our country would have against Japan and Germany. And finally, we see this last image of the flag placed upon the surface of the moon. We were the first country to reach it, to actually step out and step foot on the moon. Now, all these images end up making up the fabric of our country. They've been printed in history textbooks. They've been replayed. We might even see them as the United States starts the World Cup tomorrow. They might even show these images to drive up and to show our patriotism. And they do give us that feeling of pride for our country. But each one of these images also uniquely brings apart controversy also. In the first one, the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, that beautiful flag shown in the picture, here's the truth, that flag was not there. Why? Because that actual flag, the way it looked, was not, did it not exist until 75 years after Washington crossed the Delaware. So you know what? That beautiful flag in its current state could not have possibly been there. Next, we see the flag on Iwo Jima. This actually wasn't the first flag to be placed on the summit of that mountain. It was actually the second. This would incite controversy where people thought, was this whole thing actually just staged? Did this happen? Two of the men who were originally shown in this photo were incorrectly identified. This would leave the photographer who took this picture a full life of controversy explaining what really happened. Then finally, we have the last image, the moon landing. Now, this occurred at a time when the United States was in this great space race with Russia. And honestly, some people argue, did this actually happen? Did we actually land on the moon or was this whole thing just staged? Now, I'm not going to take any more time on my sermon on this image, and if this was staged, that's a wholly different conversation for a different day. But the point I'm making is this. These are three historic images that we've all come to know as Americans, symbols of unity. And yet behind each is very much controversy and division. The thing that seems to be missing is actually unity itself. Because the truth is this. For man... Unity on earth is impossible. It's impossible because of our sinful desire we have for ourselves. Sure, we catch glimmers of it. 
But even with all these images, something we forget is there's a totally different other side and other story that we often don't consider as Americans. In each of these prominent images, what is really happening? We're at war. We're at war with our fellow man. First war with England, second war with Japan and Germany, and third, a cold war with Russia. See, these images were meant to unite us as a country. What about our world? These images instead create division when you look at them through a world lens. We're opposing our fellow man. Much more division, much less unity. Now, you've seen the image of our flag portrayed throughout this whole sermon series. It's been in the background of all our God's guarantees images. But in the front of it has been Jesus and the cross. Now, this image was not meant to show that Christ sacrificed himself only for America. No. This was instead done to show a contrast. Because during his earthly ministry, Jesus never stepped foot on America. As you've seen throughout this series, what we've come to learn is that our country is flawed. And let's be honest, you didn't need this sermon series to realize, yes, we are not quite perfect as Americans. Because in our country, we see a lot of problems every day. There are people who are not always heard. Many people's voices have been oppressed throughout our country's history. And in our country, we know that not everyone is provided for. Many people will meet next week instead of full tables on their, Thanksgiving, on their Thanksgiving table. They'll have nothing. They will be hungry. Their basic necessities will not be met. But yet we also have billionaires who will give away billions who will still be left with billions. And in our country, not everyone is loved. There are still people who receive benefits based on their race, their economic standing, their gender, or their political affiliation. There are people who are left out. We are the United States of America, but in many ways we are divided and we will remain divided because true unity will not exist among man because sin will continue to pervade not just our thoughts, but also our actions. But division, as we learn, is not something just specific to our country. No, divisions have existed as long as mankind has existed on the earth. And we especially see this at the time surrounding Jesus' ministry. As we look through the Gospels, this becomes very apparent to us. We see that these divisions were there. First, at the time of Jesus, one of the divisions we see is we see that there were political divisions. Because, let's set the stage. At this time, the Roman government is in control. Not just of Jerusalem, the area where Jesus was, but most of the world, the Romans rule. There's a real question to us, who is God? Because in Rome, Caesar is seen as basically another deity. And the question is even asked to Jesus himself, how do you follow God and Caesar? Is it right to pay tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus sees through the hypocrisy of this question. He responds this way in Mark 12. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought him the coin and he asked them, whose image is on this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. See, with this statement, Jesus is showing that, yes, the world has political systems, but these systems are limited. They're going to continue to cause divides and divisions, but that does not mean we do, don't do our best as citizens to follow them. But as we look further, we also see that the divisions go a lot deeper in that time than just politics. See, at the time of Jesus, there were also deep economic divisions among the people. We see this prevalence whenever we read those Gospels and we look at Jesus and, and what he's doing. Anywhere he goes, he encounters a similar thing. He encounters people who are poor, people who are sick, people who are in need. They come out of everywhere because they hear that Jesus might be able to make a difference. Many of the people don't have the basic necessity of food. And we see in John, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, something really interesting happens afterward that we don't usually talk about. The masses actually want to push Jesus into power at that moment. We read from John 6. 
After the people saw the sign Jesus had performed, after he fed the thousand, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. See, Jesus saw that the most basic needs of the people were not being met. They were desperate. And here was Jesus providing them food, giving them what they needed. So what do they want to do? They want to put him in power. They want him to be that earthly leader so he can keep giving them all the earthly things they need. Yet Jesus was not meant to simply provide for our earthly needs. Because as earthly needs go, we are always going to need more. No, the need that Jesus came to eternally quench was our need for a Savior. See, this is how Jesus would ultimately provide for us through his death and through his resurrection. See, this is what Jesus reminds his disciples at of John 14, our gospel text from today. So the setting is that the disciples are all worried. Jesus has said he's going to leave them, and they're beginning to ask a lot of questions. And here's kind of how Jesus tries to calm them down. He answers them this. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. In a time where religiously people thought there might be a lot of ways, a lot of paths to the afterlife, Jesus makes it clear that there is indeed only one. Jesus was not one of many, but instead the only way. And through his work, Jesus would bring this to completion through himself. He would fix the deepest division we had, one that we couldn't fix, the sin that separated us from God. That sin would now be forgiven. That sin would now be redeemed. Yet for our people here on earth, this would not heal all the divisions that exist. Because then we hear after Jesus' death and resurrection, he ascends into heaven. His word begins to spread, but another large division shows itself again. See, this division was a religious division. See, because as we read from the entirety of the Old Testament, God has a chosen people. They are Israel. And they were his, and he was their God. Now, while we really look deeper in all those stories in the Old Testament, we see that God was indeed the God of all from the very beginning. He ends up being mostly associated with this specific group of people. He was the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. This line descends all the way to Jesus. However, Jesus was now about to adjust the narrative. He had always been the God of everyone, but he was now going to make this abundantly clear. Because Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was for all. His sacrifice was for the Romans, the Jews, the Gentiles, and everyone else in between. See, while we see earthly divisions, God sees sinners in need of a Savior. See, this is what Paul states so well in our text from Galatians today. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to to the promise. See, Paul knows that unity on earth and mankind is futile. What Paul is doing here is he's emphasizing many of the divisions that existed in that day to show that there is no thing or more apt. There's only one person that can fix us. There's only one thing that can bring us together. And what can bring us together is not a flag. It's not a country. It's not even an idea. It's actually only in the person of Jesus Christ himself. Because the only unity that is possible is through Christ. See, the unity that God provides transcends everything. Any ethnic, social, sexual, or political distinctions. Any way we divide ourselves, God sees through it. See, we could take these words that Paul spoke thousands of years ago, and we could update them today. We could say this. There is neither Republican or Democrat, rich or poor, male or female, American or foreigner, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, where we create division, God creates unity. Which brings us back to our image. The image you've seen throughout this entire sermon series, the image of Jesus carrying the cross. 
It's been there the whole time, standing in contrast to the flag in the background. But you'll know now the flag is missing. It's gone. All that's left is Jesus. Because the truth none of our, us Americans want to hear is someday America will no longer cease to exist. There will be no more borders. There will be no more boundaries in separate cities and separate states. All that will be left is what Jesus has done for us. And Jesus carried the cross for every one of us. No one is outside the boundaries of the salvation that God guaranteed through his death and resurrection. Now, this doesn't mean that all will be saved, but God makes the way to heaven very clear. It is only through our belief in Jesus as the Lord and our Savior with the help of the Holy Spirit. And when we look for unity, this is the only place that we can find it whether that is in Jesus' time or today. Because we look back, Jesus was sentenced to death by Pontius Pilate, the Roman ruler of that time. But yet Jesus died and rose again for Pontius Pilate. Jesus was falsely accused by the Pharisees, the religious leaders. They were the ones that dragged him in and had him put to death. Yet Jesus died and rose again for those Pharisees and those religious leaders who persecuted him. Jesus was also abandoned by his disciples, those who followed him closely. But yet, Jesus died and rose again for those disciples and for every single person he came in contact with in his personal earthly ministry. And today, when we forget Jesus, when we place our priorities or our faith in something else, we lean too much on our own understanding, or we create division instead of unity with our fellow man, even then, we can confidently declare that Jesus died and rose again for us, for each and every one of us, for you and for me. This is what brings us together. We get to inherit the kingdom of heaven not because of who we are as individuals, but to whose we are in Christ. The first place we are going to call home where there will be no division is in heaven with God. See, in that place, it will no longer matter what box you check while you're voting or what categories you fill out if you're filling out a demographic survey. The Lutherans, the Catholics, the Baptists, all our other brothers and sisters in Christ, we're not going to be separated by denominations any longer. And in heaven, there's not just going to be people from this nation. No, in heaven, there's going to be people from many nations all along the world who God has brought together. Because in that place, finally, we will be one in Christ. Because of Christ. God brings us together through his death and his resurrection. He restores what sin tore apart. And we will once again finally be able to look upon each other without shame and without any division. We will finally be united in the way that Christ intended for us to be united. God will bring us together as his redeemed and saved children. Amen. We now rise to profess our belief in the God who does bring us together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We go to our Lord in prayer. After each petition, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and invite you to respond to hear our prayer. Father, we, we come to you acknowledging that we live in a world where there is division and distinction that is made, and far too often we fall prey to that. And we even take a, a level of pride in who we are, the place that we have, the privileges that we have. And Father, I pray that uh, we would 
gather around the cross and see that the ground is level at the cross, that we are all coming to you as sinners who are in need of saving, that we are all cleansed and redeemed through the waters of holy baptism, and as we put our faith and our trust in you, you are the one that brings us together. Lord, continue to guide your church forward in seeking that unity that is in your Son, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we continue to pray for this country, especially this week, as we prepare to gather around tables to celebrate Thanksgiving. And Lord, I know that there's going to be tables where there is division that is present. People who voted differently, people who believe differently. And yet, Lord, help us to gather and to be grateful and ultimately to look to you as the one who gives us all good gifts. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we are thankful that we get to celebrate this weekend. Your word says to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything that you have commanded us. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the baptism of John Henry Kapusman and also the confirmation at our late service of Mason Montaifo. We pray for each of these, your children, that they may walk in your ways and know your love. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we know sometimes there are things in life that we go through that make us feel like we are separated, make us feel like we are cut off. We pray for the family of Brent Harms, whose funeral was here on Friday. We pray that even though death has separated them, that you have the power to overcome death in the grave, that you would give them that confidence that just as Jesus says in John chapter 14, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. So Lord, comfort that family with that hope. Lord, in your mercy. And for those, Lord, who are sick and hospitalized, we lift them to you. We ask that you would give us opportunities as we recognize these names as people who are members of this congregation or friends or family that we would reach out, especially this week with Thanksgiving where maybe they're not able to gather in the same way with others to share your love with them. We pray for Stacy Bukinski, for Jane Revering, Dwayne Hoyer, Norman Willems, Marion Shrub. Lori Storms, Chad Hankey, Bridget Hale, Tammy Essie, Faye Ernst, Robert Nelson, Karen Johnson, Pearl Shrupp, Todd Schultz, Larry Hoffman, Gary Radke, Lorena Pauley, Cindy Beck. Lord, in your mercy. These prayers, Lord, and others, we lift to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, who has taught and invited us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated as at this time our ushers bring forward our offerings. Each week as we receive offerings, you have the opportunity to give that online. We have a QR code that's in the bulletin if you'd like to give that way. And we also have offering boxes in the back either before the service or after the service that you're free to drop your offerings in as we bring them to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, all good gifts come from you, and we thank you in the midst of an unstable economy, in the midst of challenges that we face as a nation, that we have your guarantees, 
that you provide all that we need for this body and this life. And as we gather this week to celebrate Thanksgiving, Lord, we are grateful for all that you have provided. Receive these gifts as an expression of our gratitude to you. Use them to continue to carry on the mission of your church as we continue to make disciples, as we continue to point people toward you, to put their trust in your promises now and for eternity. In your name we pray. Amen. As we leave this time of worship then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you now and always his peace. Amen. We sing our closing hymn.